Okay, um, well, hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the Physics Colloquium today. Uh, I'm Joe Orenstein, and um, this afternoon it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Rob Goldston of Princeton University, uh, where he is a professor of astrophysical sciences and is also associate faculty with Princeton's program on science and global security. So, just a very brief word about his uh, career and background. Um, his research background is in the area of plasma physics. Uh, he was director of the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory from 1997 to 2009. And for his contributions in this area, he received the American Physical Society Excellence in Plasma Physics Award in 1988 and the Fusion Power Associates Leadership Award in 2001. He is as well a longtime US representative on the ITER Science and Technology Advisory Committee. He's visiting us today uh, to speak not primarily about plasma astrophysics, but rather the issue of nuclear arms proliferation about which he is an expert. He is a member of a group of physicists, uh, the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction uh, that is associated with the American Physical Society. And the members of this group have volunteered to offer colloquia to universities around the country uh, to raise awareness of this issue. So now if you're weary of worrying about global pandemics, you're invited to turn your attention to yet another path to global annihilation. So without further ado, I will turn the Zoomophone over to Professor Goldston. You're muted. I had an unmute uh, here. Yeah, there we go. Thank you kindly. I guess somehow I got muted. Um, okay, uh, so I'm gonna here to talk to you about, yes, indeed, another potential disaster uh, uh, and a very serious one uh, that I think needs to be considered on a sort of a level playing field with uh, climate change and with uh, pandemics. So I'm gonna talk to you about the arms race uh, that we've been through in the arms race that's coming uh, and talk about how we could maybe prevent what the, the coming arms race that could, uh, we, we kind of survived the last one, but who knows about the next one. So what you see here is uh, the first uh, thermonuclear test, the first major thermonuclear test that the United States did with what's called dry fuel. And I'll tell you what that is in a moment. You can see it's pretty big. There are these guys standing next to it but, it, but the wet fuel version couldn't even be delivered in an airplane, really. Whereas this one, um, here it is sitting on the ground and was later developed for uh, airplanes and, and here's the explosion itself. Um, this test gave rise to a yield of 15 million tons of TNT, a thousand times the Hiroshima yield. Um, it was actually that big, a factor of two and a half more than predicted uh, because they made a mistake in the nuclear physics. They left out some of the neutron lithium reactions uh, that produced more tritium in this reactor, in this uh, weapon. Uh, it caused a whole lot of fallout and created a, a huge tension about fallout. Uh, some Japanese in a, a trawling vessel uh, had acute radiation sickness. One clearly died of it. Um, my professor, uh, Marshall Rosenbluth, who was Fermi's student, uh, was on um, uh, a Navy vessel and looked up into the sky and saw that thing on the right and said it looked like a diseased brain. And he decided he'd go work in controlled nuclear fusion. There was a, enough of this. So I'm gonna talk to you about sort of how the arms race passed through this phase and how the North Koreans, for example, are at this phase. Um, and I'm speaking for the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction which is almost unpronounceable, particularly if you try to read their, uh, read our website, but it's physicistscoalition.org. And so let's, uh, so to speak, launch right into it. So the weapon used on Hiroshima was pretty straightforward. It was called Little Boy. It, had, it weighed four tons and it had a yield of 15,000 tons, which gives you an idea of, of the difference between chemical weapons and nuclear weapons. Uh, there's the uranium target on the right into which a uranium bullet was shot. 
Uh, in this process, they assembled more than one critical mass of highly enriched uranium in about uh, half a millisecond. So more than a critical mass means that as the, um, as the neutrons are colliding with, in this case, uranium, more neutrons are produced than are consumed and so the whole thing uh, exponentiates. Uh, they had about 64 kilograms of highly enriched uranium, um, but they only fissioned uh, less than about one kilogram of that. Uh, and again, made this 15,000 tons of TNT out of one kilogram of uranium. Um, this caused 100,000 immediate deaths at Hiroshima. Uh, this gun type assembly was so reliable that it wasn't even tested before use. We kind of knew how this was gonna work. However, the weapon used on Nagasaki was trickier. It, uh, it had a yield of about 21 kilotons and a mass of five tons, again, this huge ratio. And the way it worked is that you took six kilograms of almost pure plutonium-239, very little plutonium-240, and instead of 500 microseconds, you compress this in one microsecond. And instead of assembly, you really did compression. So these high explosive lenses were used to raise the plutonium core uh, to a density significantly above metallic density, a pretty amazing thing to do. This was needed to be done. It was needed to be done very rapidly because whenever you produce plutonium-239, uh, it's in a nuclear reactor. There's a lot of neutrons around. And so the plut plutonium-239 will absorb a neutron and become plutonium-240 and 240 undergoes spontaneous fission. Uh, and if there were enough neutrons around, it would cause the chain reaction to start too soon. Uh, so the way this works is you minimize those neutrons. And then what you do is you crush polonium 210 that you also make in a reactor, at, which is all mixed with beryllium uh, or, or sort of a little foil between it and the beryllium. Uh, and when this gets crushed together as the uh, plutonium core collapses, uh, alpha particles from the polonium release neutrons from the beryllium. Um, so this weapon fissioned about a kilogram of plutonium and actually some of the uranium that was around the outside um, out of six kilograms of uh, plutonium. Uh, and so that's way more efficient than the gun type weapon. It caused about 60,000 immediate deaths because the terrain was hillier and the, the hills kind of shielded some of the people. Uh, it did require a test in advance of use in the Almogordo Desert. The test was called the Trinity Test. And that's where J. Robert Oppenheimer famously said, I am become the destroyer of worlds. This was a terrifying experience. So that was the beginning of the nuclear arms race. And we know that in 1949, the Russians also detonated a weapon. Uh, but in the early 50s, things started to change. And we're gonna just go through some of the physics of how nuclear weapons evolved. Um, so uh, the first step was to have a little, a little um, piece of plutonium uh, in the middle, but then have a flying plate, a flying sphere of metal that would collapse on it. And, and the, the big deal there was the same idea as is here, which is if you have a hollow weapon, um, what you can do is build up a lot of energy in this shell by flying inwards, doing uh, DW work, PDV work, uh, and since the volume is very large that you're compressing, uh, it, you get a lot of delta volume, a lot of energy that gets first into the kinetic energy of the shell moving inwards and then into shock waves that are, that are crushing in effect if it's a hollow system, one side against the other side. So that was a big advance. It was trickier. You had to really bring this in more symmetrically or more confidently symmetrically. But then the, the, the biggest step forward was one that was done by uh, Edward Teller, uh, where he came up with the idea that you should put deuterium. Uh, I guess I probably don't need to tell you guys that deuterium is a proton and one neutron and tritium is a proton and two neutrons. Bring that gas, bring that together in the middle of this weapon. So we're compressing now not such super duper pure plutonium-239. Uh, but we're, protect, uh, we're, we're compressing it rapidly and symmetrically. That's a trick here. And then what we're gonna do is flash it with neutrons from an external neutron generator to start the chain reaction at really the right time. This uh, plutonium, uh, polonium beryllium thing, it was good, but it was a little bit, little bit off in the timing and it was better to have real control over the timing. 
Uh, and so what happens in this system, you flashed it with the external neutrons after it's begun to compress, uh, you get it to, to now make a fair bit of uh, chain reaction. And, you know, there's 200 MeV per, per fission event, and there's, you know, 200 and some electrons around every uranium. And so per particle, you know, there's, if you burned it all, it'd be like an MeV per particle. And so even if you burn, you know, begun to burn a few percent of it, it's, it's very, very, very hot material. And that's hot enough to drive the fusion of this deuterium and tritium gas. And so this makes a big burst of 14 MeV neutrons from the DT fusion. Um, that actually does not make a big a contribution to the net yield of the, uh, uh, the, the, the fusion itself isn't a big contribution, but it, it dramatically jumps up the curve on which the plutonium is exponentiating its growth. So a big jump up on that curve means you get to get much more burned up. The burn up is substantially increased. Uh, this thing can be much lighter and smaller than fat man because you get this, this volume over which you can compress the thing. Uh, so it's like, it's, um, some people say that the difference between this and fat man is that fat man is like putting a hammer on a nail and then try to press it in. It takes a lot of work, takes a lot of doing. But on the other hand, if you can swing the hammer, if you can get this shell coming inwards, uh, now you can, you can, with the same pressure, you can commit a lot more energy to the system. And so the whole system is much lighter and much smaller than Fat Man. It was a extremely dangerous, uh, but extremely clever idea. And J. Robert Oppenheimer really thought this was great. It was more reliable, it was safer, and it was much, much less vulnerable to one weapon going off, uh, causing the other one to go off at the wrong time. So this was a huge step forward. Then came the much larger, uh, well, in some sense, much larger step forward. Uh, what are called technically two-stage weapons, but you may know of them as the hydrogen bomb. Uh, and the basic idea here is you start with a primary on the left, uh, could be on the right, but I put it on the left, um, and it's gonna set off a secondary. And two key ideas make this arrangement uniquely effective and has been picked up by um, people who are making serious nuclear weapons. Uh, the first device is the, the thing I told you, I showed you before. Uh, and, and as I told you, it's mighty, mighty hot. And it's, you know, really mighty, mighty, mighty hot after it's been burning for a while. Um, after that, after that um, fusion flash, but then the, the uh, plutonium is burning. Uh, it emits x-rays. The x-rays, not surprisingly, move at the speed of light. Uh, using this casing, they get, they get around the secondary and they compress the secondary. Um, if you thought that using explosives with this uh, swinging hammer approach was a cool way to compress something, uh, try using energetic x-rays. It's a whole other class of beast. So this is a tremendously powerful compression. Uh, and then the other thing is now you've got it compressed, but it's lithium and deuterium. That's not too exciting. Well, you're now going to get a little behind the x-rays. You're going to get a flash of neutrons. The neutrons will strike the lithium-6. That'll produce tritium in C2. And so you don't, need to, you don't need to bring along with you a cryogenic system. The original weapon was going to require a cryogenic system to keep liquid deuterium and tritium and was going to require you to make tritium in reactors, which was going to be insanely expensive. Um, and, and Oppenheimer, who was opposed to, the, to the, um, this two-stage weapon, opposed to the hydrogen bomb, when he realized there were these two cute tricks, uh, you can just see it in his head. You can see the light saying, you know, this is so cute, we have to try it. Um, so the, the deuterium plus tritium, meanwhile, in here, uh, we were having some fun making a big fusion reaction in here uh, because we made the neutrons that turned the lithium into tritium and we had the deuterium and so boom, literally, uh, but then, 14 MeV neutrons come out of that big fusion bang. And then that also causes fission, uh, particularly in the casing here that might be U-238. Uh, and so you have a whole series of fission and fusion um, playing against each other, uh, playing with each other. The US maximum yield was 15 megatons. The Soviets actually did a 50 plus megaton weapon. It was called the Tsar Bomba, which is a remarkable name for a weapon made by a communist country. But anyway, it was a big bomb. Um, so these weapons 
uh, got very large very quickly. Uh, but then, they, but then, then we kind of changed course. We're taking you through the uh, the arms race. Um, so in the 1970s, uh, we came up with what are called uh, multiple independently targetable reentry vehicles, MIRVs. Um, so these were miniature warheads whose yield was in the hundreds of kilotons, and these MIRVs rode on a bus. We call it a bus, uh, in the same sense that not exactly the same sense that school children ride on a bus. And um, instead of delivering the kids back to their homes after school, this delivers nuclear weapons to whatever targets you want uh, that they, they get dropped off the bus in different cities or in different um, places where there are nuclear forces. So this is a, was, was a way different beast than the gigantic megaton beasts. And they came from the fact that we had much more accurate missiles after a while. And so you didn't meet, need to make a gigantic hole in the ground. You could make a more moderate sized hole in the ground and just put it in the right place. Um, multiple lighter warheads on one missile was way more cost effective than one gigantic missile with one gigantic warhead on it. Uh, um, however, this created a highly unstable situation, an insanely unstable situation. It was already bad enough we had all these weapons. But each of one side's MIRV missiles now could take out many of the other side's missiles. So one missile of yours, this, this, this particular thing had six warheads on it, you could have 10. One missile of yours could take out six of the other guys. Uh, by the same token, one missile of his could take out six of yours. I guess I've only got five here. Um, so what it means is the guy who strikes first has a big advantage. Kissinger had a moment when he could have negotiated this away, but the US was kind of ahead and the Russians kind of want to try it too. And so there was a sort of an agreement that we didn't negotiate, we didn't control this, which was a terrible mistake. It's, it's a miracle that we survived this. Um, they strengthened the need for a hair trigger response for launch on warning. If the other guy is bringing in these missiles that can then MIRV and, and very easily take out your warheads, um, your missiles with their warheads, um, you really wanted to get your stuff in the air before the other guy's stuff landed on you. Um, eventually, uh, as part of the um, New START agreement, the US has demerved our ICBMs, but we can still upload about half of them to three warheads per missile and the other half to two warheads per missile. Uh, and that uploading process was scary as hell because you know if the other guy's uploading his war more warheads, you might think it's time to take out their ICBMs. Russia has big MIRVED ICBMs uh, called SARMATs that they're building. And it's due to concern over our missile defenses. They really wanted to be able to get a lot of missiles in the air cheaply and quickly. Uh, so to overwhelm our, our missile defenses. Um, we talked about bang for the buck. I don't think the Russians that use this expression, but I like the expression rubble for the ruble. This was the way to get the most rubble for the ruble was uh, doing this. And that's what they have still. Okay, so the US has conducted as many nuclear tests as the rest of the world put together. The light blue here is Russia, the green is the United States. You can see this exponentiation that was going on here. Uh, and then you see no tests for a couple of years except for the French. The French, you know, like to do what they like to do. Uh, but there was a moratorium between Khrushchev and uh, Eisenhower, uh, which fell apart with the um, fell apart with the U-2 incident where we had a spy plane that was shot down over Russia and we lied to them about it. The Cuban Missile Crisis didn't do anybody any good and so this started to get really crazy. And then eventually we made a deal where at least testing went underground and the fallout from the tests was a much, much less of a concern. Arguably, you know, this is a little bit of a deal with the devil. We just kept doing testing and we didn't have the public concern about, about fallout. Um, over here, you can see our friends from North Korea. Uh, here was the, co the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty was negotiated. It hasn't been put into, into play yet, uh, but, it, but people are following the norm with the exception of uh, India and Pakistan and our friends in North Korea. Um, so this thing that happened in 5960 was remarkable. It's possible that if we had been able to make a comprehensive test ban treaty, not just a a partial test ban treaty, got to do it only underground, you know, maybe we could have avoided all of this and it, and it just was a tremendous missed opportunity. Okay, so 
I'm just going to take you quickly through what the North Koreans are doing, and they appear to be doing just exactly what we did. They're, they're doing their own little arms race. Uh, so here is Kim Jong-un, helpfully holding his hand up in front of his weapon, so we can measure the size of the weapon. Uh, they claim to have mastered fusion uh, in some of their literature. Maybe they are DT boosted. Uh, they also claim to have diversified their fuel. Maybe this could be, in principle, a uranium-235 weapon, in which case we wouldn't know how many of them there were because we don't know how much uranium enrichment capability they have. This could be a uranium implosion weapon, which is sort of a marriage between the Hiroshima and Nagasaki weapons, but you can do it. The Chinese did that uh, as their first, their first weapons. Um, because they made weapons before they had plutonium reactors. Um, and you can boost them. So uh, that could be maybe what they've got. Um, and we call this in the non-proliferation community, the disco ball. Now they may have a two-stage weapon. They, they showed us this picture. We, you can measure, here's Kim Jong-un's hand. We can measure the size of this, this one end of the peanut. We call this the peanut. Uh, and the disco ball fits inside this end of the peanut. So that could be the primary, it could be, it could be in principle, moving x-rays down here to a secondary. Um, US statement about this is ambiguous about their testing as an advanced nuclear weapon. Um, we don't know that they had this underground, but we do know uh, that the peanut or its brother, whatever the brother was underground, made a heck of a big bang. So here are North Korean test seismographs starting back in 2006, seismographs from their tests, uh, from 2006 uh, through 2016 and ultimately to 2017. And maybe in here, they were mastering boosting. Maybe in here, they were uh, mastering uranium-235 fuel. We don't really know. Uh, but over here, they basically destroyed the mountain they were testing under. Uh, the, the, the top of the mountain fell in. Uh, didn't fall in that far, but it clearly was destabilized. Um, the best guess is that this is somewhere in the range of 150 to 200 kilotons. Um, the remarkable thing about it is this is comparable to the size of the weapons that are in the US arsenal. So the North Koreans have tested nuclear explosives. We're not sure it's that peanut, uh, but they have tested nuclear explosives with the same yield as what are on uh, our submarines and our ICBMs. It's hard to imagine this is not a two-stage weapon. It's actually pretty hard to make a 200 kiloton explosion with just fission. It burns up a tremendous amount of your fissile material. It's uh, pretty unstable because you know it's got to come together, but it's got to have started um, you know, below a critical mass and get above a critical mass and then really burn up. It's, it's, um, we have done this in the US program, but this is very tricky. Uh, and, and, and why would they do that? It's a big weapon. Um, so this is probably a two-stage weapon. And just not to be left out, these guys have recently paraded the largest road mobile missiles in the world. Road mobile missiles are much harder to get than ones that are in, in land-based silos. You can't find them on Google Maps. Uh, and these things are huge. Um, you could mer if you could merv the peanut, if you had the peanut and you merved it and you put it in here, it would pretty much overwhelm any imaginable US missile defenses. So these guys are headed down the same path, essentially that the Russians have gone down. Um, road mobile missiles, MIRVs, looks like where they're headed. We would really like them not to test the MIRVs. We'd really like them not to test re-entry vehicles. Uh, but, that's, but, but it's just showing you this is kind of the structure of what an arms race looks like. And so just to kind of finish off the story, what does this look like? Um, a one kiloton blast uh, will level an area that's with a radius of about 2,300 feet and kill about 75,000 people in New York. A Hiroshima type blast, Nagasaki type blast would kill 400,000 people and something like what we think the North Koreans have would uh, the, the circle of that blast is outside of this whole picture and it would kill about a million people. Um, There'd be firestorm and fallout deaths, long-term contamination. None of that is included here. Um, you, can, you can go to this place here, just go to nuke map. And if you have a, uh, you'd like to try out, you know, leveling San Francisco, have at it. Okay, so 
what's the sort of, let's step back a little bit and look at the big picture here. Um, what, what happened over time is uh, the US built up its arsenal pretty rapidly. And there's a little bit of an, of, of an object lesson here. Here it is 1960, here's the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the US has like almost 10 times more warheads than the, uh, uh, in our active stockpile than the Russians do. And yet just the dozen warheads must have been of order a dozen warheads that they had in Cuba, medium range ballistic missiles were enough to deter us from invading Cuba from, from doing, basically they, they would stop us in our tracks from doing anything that the Russians didn't want. We, end, we ended up, of course, making some deals with the Russians to get away from the Cuban Missile Crisis. But it shows you that even the weaker guy has tremendous, once he's got some nuclear weapons, he has tremendous deterrence capability. Anyway, we got into the idea that what you needed for deterrence is to be the guy who won. And what did winning mean? Winning meant that at the end of the war, you had more weapons still in your pocket, whatever that, you know, for whatever use. And if there were um, two people alive in the United States and one person alive in Russia, so long as it was in the United States, a man and a woman, it was okay. I mean, this was an insane idea of what wars were about. Uh, but, but the idea was that you couldn't deter the other guy unless you could convince him that you could beat him. And so that results in this kind of essentially insane behavior. Way back here, it was adequate deterrence for any political reason. Uh, but Reagan, um, and I'll talk a little bit about how Reagan changed his perspective. Reagan went from a blow off the face of the earth kind of guy to a, we really need to get this stuff under control kind of a guy. Actually, arguably Kennedy did too. If you look at the early Kennedy, he's really about, we'll do anything you need to defend freedom. And then the later Kennedy is very focused on getting this um, nuclear test ban treaty. So that it's, it, at least for some people, getting into the presidency and seeing what's going on has a big effect. So Reagan, Reagan was into trust but verify, which apparently he couldn't pronounce very well and it would drive Gorbachev crazy. Uh, and Gorbachev was into, if there are enough guns around, they begin shooting on their own, no one's responsible for what happens. And so we get this dramatic fall, this dramatic dropping in both, in both stockpiles. Uh, so this is a huge big deal, the end of the Cold War in effect. Um, dramatic reduction since the Cold War, but what we have left is, um, there's a lot that's sitting uh, in ready to be retired, but what we have left in the active stockpiles of the US and Russia are more than 90% of all weapons. You know, we really don't want North Korea or, uh, you know, uh, I, guess, I guess Iran doesn't have any weapons, so they're not on this list. We don't want North Korea in a position to, to put MERV nuclear weapons onto our cities. Uh, but, but the guys who are more likely to do it are, are the Russians and, and we to the Russians. We have enough, plenty of stuff to destroy civilization with what's left. Um, and so that's, here's what that would look like. So this we call Plan A. Uh, this was some work done at Princeton, um, a depiction of how a conflict between Russia and the US could escalate from conventional war to nuclear war. Real force postures, real targets, fatality estimates from uh, Nukem, actually. Um, so this sort of frames us as the bad guys. We're doing a uh, US NATO advance into um, Russian territory. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's realistic. Uh, Russia is pretty interested in its own near abroad. So maybe it was a Russian incursion. I don't know. We, we framed it as the US acts first, acts first. Uh, but the Russians say, you know, enough of this, we need to stop you guys and tell you that we don't want you invading uh, Russian territory. So this is Kaliningrad here, a little, little chunk of Russia that's off the, uh, that's separated from the main part of Russia. Uh, so we think, you know, well, let's take out whatever the guys who are, who did this to us. We'll teach them a lesson. Uh, the problem is that if you do this on either side, you've killed lots and lots of civilians uh, all around these, these bases. And there's a, uh, a, a tremendous outcry that you can't let these guys get away with this. You can't let these murderers get away with this. Uh, and so, you know, the Russians feel they kind of have to, have to stop us. Um, and so, well, I don't know what all these lines are. Michael Plus is adding some lines for us. Anyway, so here come, here come the Russians and the Americans are like, we better get our stuff off the ground. 
or these things come and destroy our bases. And so um, now the Americans are in the process of using sub-strategic nuclear weapons all over, all over uh, Turkey and Russia and, and further out. And now the Russians uh, are using their missiles before we destroy them with our bombers. Uh, and they're taking out a whole lot of Europe. Uh, they to put Spain there. Uh, and so now what happens is that um, there's a concern that the other guy might attack the United States. The United States was successful with our strategic weapons. That after all of this destruction in Europe, uh, you know, how can you let them get get away with it, kind of thing? So here come the Americans. Uh, they were going to take out all of the first sector of the nation. We use some of our submarines as well as our ICBMs. And so they're coming around the Mercator projection in strange ways. Uh, but the Russians, they have early warning systems and they're getting their stuff off. They've got plenty of other targets in the United States. Um, this is what this looks like as it escalates up. You know, we're starting all of Europe. Um, how are we going to let the other guy destroy you? This idea of damage and evolution is insane. So that's what the United States is doing. Now, this early, uh, has to be is that there's a counter value plan out of court that you want to not let the other guy build up. Um, so, what you do is you destroy his economic base. So, here we are from our submarines largely uh, launching stuff all over the world to all over Russia, but Russia's got the same idea with us. And by the time this is done, uh, within hours, something like 90 million people are dead. And that's just the beginning of it. Um, so this was 91.5 million people within hours. Um, and it, it, um, so what's going to happen after this is uh, nuclear winter. What's going to have to happen after this is, uh, is death from firestorms, fallout, and ultimately nuclear winter. Um, could be very much that um, very much that the, the ability to grow crops for something like a decade is reduced by something like a factor of two, and many many people starve. So maybe we can get rid of these annotations somehow. Let me take a moment and find annotations. Disable annotations for others. That sounds like a good start. And um, where's my own annotations? I don't seem to have it. Hide names of annotations. Okay, you can, well. Uh, end the PowerPoint and restart the PowerPoint. I think that's a good idea. I think it'll, we'll, we'll, I'll give it a try. Uh, let's see, how am I going to do that? I guess I'll do this. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's still there. Yeah, but we'll, I'll try it again. Yep. Well, we have a decorated screen. Here we go. So, now, what's happening now? I mean, so that situation that I told you is pretty much, oh no, here's annotate, I found it. Okay, here we go, annotates here. And, uh, oh, come on. What's funny is it's probably, let's see. Like this. Uh, I seem to have lost the. Okay, well, here we go. Arms control and reverse gear. So, so a very important thing is the anti ballistic missile treaty entered into force in 1972. And this was a big part of controlling the arms race. Um, if the other guy can shoot down your missiles, you need to build more missiles. Um, and, and, and all of this is, is living in a world of uncertainty. So now you have the uncertainty of you don't know how many missiles the other guy has, and another uncertainty if you don't know how good his anti-ballistic missile systems are. So it, it sort of doubles the, the impetus if you're, going to be, if you're going to be conservative, as a military guy kind of has to be, it doubles the impetus for you to build more weapons and more anti-ballistic missile weapons too. 
Well, the US got out in 2002 because we were concerned about the axis of evil, Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. Uh, and um, this motivated the Russians to come up with systems that could avoid the, uh, to, could avoid anti-ballistic missiles. Huh. Okay. Now I, I'm stuck here. I'm sorry, guys. Um, maybe I will stop the sharing and start again. Okay, so let's uh, share screen. This may be a better thing to do, except for that. Uh, <laughs> pardon me. Is that going to work? Ah, yes. Okay. And we got rid of the, scri the scribbles, but I don't see you guys anymore. Okay, so here are you guys over here, and here I'm I. Sorry about this. Okay, so the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty kind of doubled the impetus to do crazy stuff. We see you, but we don't see your screen. We don't see that, yeah. Okay, so let's try that again. Uh, <laughs> yes, I know what's wrong. Uh, share screen. Okay, does that look more like it? Yep. You can keep, okay, great. Uh, arms control and reverse gear. So we're going the wrong way. Anti-ballistic missile treaty, we got out of it in 2002. It seemed like it was sort of okay because we didn't know what was going on. But what was going on is the Russians were developing uh, weapons, kind of crazy weapons. Um, they were developing hypersonic uh, warheads that could sort of bounce along the top of the atmosphere instead of going way out into space. They bounced along the top of the atmosphere so that our ABM systems that were interested in mid-course uh, capture of the mid-course destruction. There was no mid-course. This stuff was bouncing along and, and uh, able to direct itself in strange ways uh, and avoided that. Uh, there's also this crazy idea of a uh, giant nuclear torpedo that is nuclear powered and plows into a uh, port and blows up with a huge warhead. Uh, no way your anti-ballistic missile stuff is gonna get that. And then the really crazy idea of a nuclear powered cruise missile that can come at the United States, you know, from any which way, including under the South Pole. Uh, they tried to test that in, you know, on the ocean off of Siberia and it kind of blew up, which was a problem. So we, we refer to this as the flying Chernobyl. I'm not too worried about that one, but I am, I am worried about the others. Um, then we got out of the intermediate range nuclear forces treaty recently. Uh, and this treaty was a good treaty. It was it kept us from being so trigger happy in Europe, uh, because you know the European capitals and and Moscow are pretty close together, and so if you had uh, intermediate range nuclear forces, you could in sort of ten minutes decapitate the other guy's systems. So that was a big deal to have that treaty. Well, um, we kind of overdid it. It wasn't just nuclear forces, and it wasn't just in Europe. What really mattered was intermediate range nuclear forces in Europe. And we could have renegotiated this probably to, yeah, you can have intermediate range nuclear forces, pardon me, intermediate range missiles, but we will check whether they're nuclear. And there's ways to do this in a, in a, a way that isn't too revealing, but, but it definitely tells you whether there's a warhead there. We did that, we do that within the New START Treaty and we did that before. Um, but anyway, US, uh, US withdrew out of this thing. We had an open skies treaty deal where people could fly airplanes with certain kind of sensors over other people's countries and see if forces were being massed, see if um, what, uh, you know, if nuclear missiles were being uh, moved around or, or more of them being built, for example. Uh, now, our satellites were good for, the, for a lot of this, but uh, a lot of our allies really depended on these open skies uh, information. The US withdrew from that. Now, the good news is the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty that entered into force in February 5th, 2011. And it's been renewed for five years. Uh, the Biden administration managed to do that in 16 days. Um, but the, the thesis of the rest of what we're gonna discuss is how can we use these five years to prevent another huge arms race? So first of all, let's, let's look at this story. Uh, what about arms races? So here's, here, here is Reagan's buildup. Let me go back. Here's Reagan's buildup. This is the uh, blow him off the place of the planet, Reagan. Uh, the only way to have a good deterrent is just to have a bigger gun than the other guy. He played in all those Westerns, you know? Draw faster, have a bigger gun. 
uh, well, uh, he realized the situation was crazy, and I'll talk about that in a moment. The, Internet, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty uh, went into effect uh, during Reagan's administration, and we built down just, we, well, we didn't build that. Yeah, we built down the number of warheads, but we, we reduced the funding to the whole nuclear enterprise tremendously. Um, so this is nuclear communications command and control. Here's uh, bombers, ICBMs. These are land-based uh, miss intercontinental missiles. This is sea-based intercontinental missiles. And um, so then the other thing that happened that's quiet is we abrogated the IBM treaty. And this triggered a big Russian buildup, as I told you about things that could get away, from, get around our anti-ballistic missile systems. They, they really, we, we actually don't believe they work, but they really believe they work. And so they're, or they could work. And so if you're being conservative, you have to deal with that. And that, that pushed the Russians forward. And then paradoxically, here's the new START treaty. You might say, well, look, the INF treaty was good news. The ABM treaty was, abrogation was bad news. So the new START treaty must be good news, but not so. Part of the deal with Congress was that we would have a major recapitalization, rebuild up of the American forces. We would start this arms race again. The Russians were, you know, responding to our ABM treaty abrogation. You could argue they were, they were starting this, uh, but very clearly we played a big role in this. Um, so Russia and China are working on new systems. How do we make this not turn into another arms race, another big arms race? So how was the arms race stopped in the 1980s? Um, so the thing on the left is this movie, The Day After. Um, so this, uh, this was a made-for-TV movie. It was seen by hundreds of millions of people, actually, and it was utterly terrifying. Uh, to me, the scariest moment is actually the one on this picture. So here we are in Kansas, uh, the, near the University of Kansas, where there was a ballistic missile field. And there are the American ballistic missiles taking off just basically like in that Plan A uh, video I showed you. Uh, and, you know, okay, so we're defending ourselves. We're killing the bad guys. Well, you know exactly what's coming back in the next 20 minutes. And, and it does show up and it's, it's, it's horrific. The story is that uh, Reagan was, was affected by this. The generals, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff had their own showing of it and they all came out, you know, on the one hand, kind of this is gonna make it hard for us to keep building our missiles. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, really realizing just how horrific this was. Another thing was the political forces of the nuclear freeze campaign. And these are tied together in ways that the, that the communications and the protests uh, built on each other. This, this created some pressure to, uh, that led to the, uh, the INF Treaty. Um, but maybe the most powerful thing was uh, a military exercise we did in, in then West Germany called Abel Archer 83, uh, in which we did a, um, an exercise where we pretended that we were gonna do a nuclear um, attack, frankly, it was supposed to be defensive attack, but a nuclear attack on Russia uh, we, ra we ramped up our nuclear systems. We brought lots and lots of tanks up to the border. Uh, we kind of played it harder than we never played it before. And the rush, including some communications to Washington uh, that the Russians could monitor. And the Russians really were scared. So the Russians ra ramped up their nuclear forces to a much higher level than they'd ever done during one of our exercises. And the guy who was in charge, Lieutenant General Perut, um, looked in the manual and the manual says, well, if they rise to this level, we have to rise to that level. Maybe I should make an equal. I don't know how you measure these levels. Um, so we're down here, they rose up. We're supposed to rise up too. And he says, you know, that's what my instructions say. That's what as an army officer, I have to do. My gut tells me not to, and he doesn't do it. What we now know is that at that same moment, the Russian um, Politburo was discussing whether this was a real attack that was just being, um, have a cover of being an exercise and whether they should preemptively strike the United States with their missiles because of this big advantage, this big pressure to use yours first or lose them. So, there, so the, the Politburo is discussing that and they see that we do not go up, we don't raise our nuclear readiness level and they decide not to do it. 
we were we were that close. And Reagan interviews diplomats, Russian diplomats, Soviet diplomats after this. And he says, you know, we weren't going to attack you. You know, we're the good guys. We weren't, you know, we weren't, you know, we're not doing, we don't do stuff like that. And apparently they all, the blood drained out of their faces and they said, you have no idea. You have just have no idea how close we were. And apparently uh, Reagan got it. Um, so what can we do? What can we do? So the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction, which is again, unspellable, but there it is, or at least unpronounceable. Um, so last year's campaigns, I don't think we get total credit, credit for this, but we did a campaign for avoiding support uh, for renewed nuclear testing in the National Defense Authorization Act. The, there was actually in, the, um, in this act, there was a version that said, um, yeah, why not? Let's, let's do some nuclear testing. Let's just blow off this, uh, this uh, CTBT uh, thing where we've done more testing than anyone else in the world, but let's do some more to just show we're, we're the big guys. We also worked for the extension of the New START agreement, which would have expired, but it was extended. So again, I don't think that we get credit for both of these, but um, it, was, it was what we, or we don't get all the credit for both of these, but we were campaigning for those. And now we're deciding on what to address next. Um, okay, I got a few more minutes. Um, so what's your opinion? We're gonna have a discussion at the end. You can tell us your opinions. You can come join us and be, be part of the deciding. Um, my own thinking is we should step back from the brink by eliminating silo-based ICBMs. Uh, you can find them on Google Maps. You could just go to Montana, look around, you can find these. The Russians know exactly where they are to a gnat's eyelash. They wanna target, you know, like here or over there, they know how to do it. Um, and I claim, and I think it's true, that's why I claim it, I guess, that ICBMs in silos are worse than useless. These ones, the road mobile ones, are hard to find, they don't necessarily have to be on hair trigger alert. Uh, but these are useless if they're not on hair trigger alert because they would just be destroyed immediately. So they have to be on hair trigger alert. Um, and on hair trigger alert, I claim they're worse than useless. These have negative value. Uh, they might be fired on a false alarm, maybe due to somebody's cyber intrusion. Some third party, North Korea wants to mess around with us. So it creates a, the the illusion on both sides of that one, is, one or the other is, is firing. They could be fired because we believe we're about to be attacked due to a miscalculation in the fog of conventional or sub-strategic nuclear war. Maybe somebody has an anti-satellite weapon that, that goes and messes with our satellite, with our early warning satellites, and then we're blind. So now we're, you know, we're in the OK Corral with, with guns and, and we can't see, and we don't know when the other guy is going to shoot. Got to lose your weapons in that situation. And, and I don't think they're needed for deterrence. The idea that these are important for deterrence is just silly. Uh, one, one of our 10 submarines that'll be on, on um, patrol or about a third of either side's bomber force would devastate the other side's civilization. Um, you know, be, there wouldn't be the infrastructure for food, for medicine. Uh, the living would envy the dead. Uh, you know, go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, even a few of these warheads, you know, the um, Russian leader who resulted in the destruction of Leningrad, just Leningrad, forget everything else, would be hung. Right? You, all of America isn't worth Leningrad to the Russians. So the living and, and, and this, what we have is, with just one submarine is plenty of deterrence. And frankly, if something, you know, submarines got to be easier to be seen, well, we've got the bomber force and vice versa. Um, and, and these ICBMs are useless for extended war fighting. What are we not going to shoot one or two ICBMs off? You know, if there's a, if there's, um, say, say there's a war in Europe and we're going to shoot off an ICBM, we're going to put, we're going to just ask the Russians to attack our homeland because they invaded Poland. I don't think so. Um, and, and, and besides the other side would attack them in a first strike. Uh, and so they'd all need to be fired at once. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense as part of deterrence or part of war fighting. Uh, and, it's so, and it's very, very dangerous on a trigger alert. So um, we could under New START, and I'm not gonna carry you through this in detail. We could ourselves phase out our silo-based ICBMs. We could either retire the warheads, the warhead count, or we could transfer them to submarines and bombers, keep the same warhead count if you know if if you're worried that uh, we, we can't fall behind the Russians, or we could make a deal with the Russians uh, to phase them out of both places, either retire the warheads uh, 
and not have them you know, just reduce the count. So from new start, it's like 1550, or reduce the count to like 1150. Um, or we could, or they could, both sides could transfer warheads to submarines and bombers. In either case, uh, this thing would be a much safer world to be in. And we could be showing the world that we're actually caring about, about backing down on this stuff. So how do we get rid of them? Um, you, you may have seen the movie, uh, Three Billboards Outside of uh, Ebbing. Uh, well, so we could put, you know, it's only 400 sites. Uh, billboards aren't that expensive. We could put Russian nuclear target here, billboards in front of every one of them. Uh, but it might take more than, than three billboards. I'm not sure that's the right answer. And I'm not, I'm not actually proposing exactly this. One thing that we could do is we could start talking about the fact that if we're going to put more emphasis on bombers that can be called back, missiles can't, um, you know, we get it. We get a threat of an attack from, from Russia. We can put our bombers up in the air. They can be circling, uh, they're not leaving American territory. Um, and if it turns out that it was a false alarm, they can just land again. Uh, but that means you need airfields where you can have people, uh, lots of lots of, of um, bombers, these B-21s, uh, also B-52s on strip alert. And so let's, and each of these, war, these air, um, silo fields are near airfields. So let's upgrade those airfields. Let's make sure there's plenty of money going to those states. So those states that are really, it's a big part of their economy. Let's do great stuff for their economy. So questions and answers followed by a discussion for those who want to learn more about this physicist coalition. I like the apostrophe, but it's not in the, uh, it's not in the website, the physicist coalition for nuclear threat reduction. So questions and answers, any, any questions? You just go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask, cause I don't think I can see everybody. Hi. Thank you. I, I have a really quick cool question. I think this is slide number 10. Did okay, you slide 10. Let's see if I can get back there easily. Oh yeah, this one. Is, that there, one. is there a reason why the traces look so similar? Like the first, or like traces three, four, and five? Um, well, part of it, of course, is that they're being triggered at the same time. I mean, you know, it, it isn't that they did it at exactly the same time of day each time. And this is, you know, at two in the afternoon or something. Um, and so they're triggering it on, on the first oscillation. And the oscillations do have a fundamental, you know, do have a, a, an underlying frequency to them. And, and now, if you ask me why the one, two, what the seventh bounce or something is the big one, um, <coughs> I suppose there's some interference pattern that's causing that, but I, 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 can't, I can't answer that question. So it's more yeah. about the triggering mechanism. Well, you know, it's like an oscilloscope. If you trigger it on the, you know, on a on, on a uh, uh, the rise of a pulse, all the pulses were, will more or less overlay. I mean, the shape of the signal though seems to be very similar from one no. mount to another. Well, I mean, you know, bottom line is it's the same mountain, <laughs> and, and so the pattern of the the, the pattern of the um, of the seismic waves that are traveling around the earth. And um, it's a good question as to where, I don't know the answer as to which of their stations uh, the uh, CTBT guys use to get, to get these traces uh, or whether there's some combination. I don't think it could be a combination because they'll be out of phase. So I, I think this is from some one particular station, you know, with one particular waves are gonna, you know, um, interfere in the same ways. So it's like an impulse response almost, maybe. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> it's a very fast impulse. Very well, thank you. <laughs> yep, yep, you bet. There's a whole world of trying to understand this. There's different kinds of waves, different kinds of patterns that they follow in the earth. Um, there's still, it, it, it's, it, it, it's hard to be quantitative. That's why I was saying 150, 200 uh, kilotons. We, it, we really don't know quantitatively. And there's debate, you know, there's some outliers who think it's 250 and some outliers who thinks as low as 100. Thank you. But there's nobody who thinks this, I mean, you look at those, those traces and something very different happened in 2017. Uh, let, let me try to ask a more general question for a moment is, um, 
are there groups of people that believe that there's a, a some sort of stable deterrent configuration and and are there you know diplomats or technocrats that are meeting in certain countries that are legitimately trying to uh, you know come up with a configuration that is 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 somehow stable despite the presence of all these weapons? Well, let's see. Um, stable is a big word. Um, I think as long as nuclear weapons are around, uh, there is danger that that they'll be used. That that either well, I, I suppose that the if you if you kind of multiply together uh, the degree of risk that somebody is willing to tolerate times the uh, the 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 sort of uh, bad situation that countries can get into with each other. Um, you know, the, eventually, if you have weapons around somebody, you're going you're gonna to trip that wire. Uh, you know, Kim Jong-un is going to think that it's just uh, that, that the South Koreans are ready to invade or, uh, you know, whatever. And, and it'll think he'll think it's, it's necessary for him to push the button or, you know, you just think of all the different possibilities. Um, so I'm not sure that there's a sufficiently stable world. Uh, with any nuclear weapons, which is why the the treaty for the prevent for the prohibition of nuclear weapons uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, the trick is how to get there, and how to get there in a way that is um, stable at each step down the ladder. Uh, and so, you know, here we are. I don't know. You could argue five steps up the ladder, as I as I described. So you need to you need to get down the ladder. I think there is once you recognize that. A few hundred weapons is really enough of a deterrent. That that you know, if I have two hundred nuclear weapons uh, that I have can confidently deliver to your country, you're not going to invade me. And that's the position that China has. And that's the position that France has. Uh, it's a position to some degree that uh, you know, if Israel has nuclear weapons, we think that's kind of what they're thinking. And in fact, there is this logic that says nuclear weapons are there as a defensive last resort. And if you take that position and you take the position that a few hundred detonations the other guy's country would get the other guy's leaders hung, um, there, there might be a stable, a relatively stable point at a few hundred weapons each, um, which is less likely to cause, uh, you know, horrendous nuclear winter and so on. And so that's a place you'd like to get to, uh, you know, we're right now at sort of 1500 weapons each. Uh, Maybe you can get rid of ICBMs, get down to a thousand, uh, you know, develop a situation of greater trust and keep going down. But it's 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 tricky. The the process of going down is is, is messy. And and okay. doing it stably at each step. Okay, thank, thanks. Uh, there seems to be a question from uh, Felipe. Did you want to speak? Uh, ask your question if that's in the chat. Yeah, sure. So. My question is uh, whether you have some comments on inertial confinement fusion and whether it's possible to develop weapons out of it. Um, okay, um, so uh, I actually wrote an article on this in the bulletin of the atomic science. Uh, yeah, in the bulletin of the atomic scientists, um, one could be concerned that some of the physics of uh, inertial confinement fusion are relevant to some kinds of nuclear weapons. Uh, and so in some ways, the R&D is the most dangerous part. Um, but, you know, if you're going to have uh, inertial confinement fusion systems all over the place, um, some of that science is going to leak. So that's that's a big concern. And, and I and Alex Glazer, who wrote this article, um, pointed that out. Um, the Whether you could do inertial confinement fusion as a way to... Um, is itself a nuclear weapon. You know, you're not going to drop the, the you know, uh, uh, NIF on somebody. So, I, I, and and there, there there was a lot of effort to try to come up with a way without a fission bomb to make a thermonuclear weapon. And um, it, it sort of failed. And that was why the people in the 90s were uh, more willing to have, as part of why there was a, an ability to have a communication about such things between the weapons labs in the 90s. So I'm not so worried directly about that. I am worried about the physics. 
Great, thank you. Any more questions? Hello, Professor. Um, my name is Eric. I'm an undergrad in the department here. Right. I've been kind of curious. Berkeley um, is actually one of several cities in the US that um, is a nuclear free zone by city ballot proposition in the late 80s, like uh, many other municipalities. And I was sort of curious um, as cities, counties, and states are not military actors, what you think of those types of legislation and whether they should be removed or modified or extended or whether legislation at those levels can be uh, beneficial to nuclear deterrence. Uh, the I one stipulation that's sort of a roadblock in Berkeley is that the city can't enter into contracts with any actor that uh, is in favor of nuclear weapons or works in favor of nuclear weapons. And so for the university and the lab, this changes some of the way that uh, radioactive materials are handled. And I was curious if you could comment on those sorts of issues. Well, um, first of all, I think it, it is effective for uh, cities and countries uh, to be putting pressure on the system that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's getting to be time to bring these numbers down. Um, you know, these are, you know, however you want to count it, 4,000 weapons each or something, um, 1,500 deployed weapons um, in a certain definition of deployed. So it's good for there to be pressure to, to bring those things down. This is why the TPNW is, is a good thing. And the US should be in a, in a funny way, at least supporting it, even though we're not right, quite ready to sign it because of this question of how do you work your way down? How do you verify it? Part of my research is in how you verify these things. But I think that, and, and another thing actually that's effective is there are um, treaties in various parts of the world, like in South America, I'm never going to pronounce this correctly, but there's the Treaty of Tlatel Local or something, which is an agreement that we won't have nuclear weapons in uh, in South America, amongst the countries in South America that that inspect each other and and have some confidence in in what they're doing. There's a similar Euratom. <laughs> Euratom actually started as a as a secret plan for how Europe could build nuclear weapons, uh, but then ended up being a, a deal for how they would keep keep track of each other that they weren't building nuclear weapons. Uh, there's something uh, something similar in in um, uh, that I forget who all is in it, but one of them is Australia. Um, anyway, so those things are effective too. Um, I think I mean I, I'm a little curious as to how it is that the the city of Berkeley says it won't do deals with anybody who favors nuclear weapons. You to get no federal funding in Berkeley. I mean that's a little odd. I mean the United States government appears to be you know happy to have a lot of nuclear weapons. This was sort of my curiosity. Obviously, UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley being federal uh, contractors and federally controlled, the city can't limit them. So it seems to me that this legislation might be strictly performative on the part of the city and, of course, serves to pressure uh, larger wings of government uh, in this direction. But I was curious whether there was any non-performative role uh, that the city I, I, could take or that, or that local uh, institutions over which individuals might have greater influence? What, uh, you know, um, uh, I, there are, the state of New Jersey, for example, um, came out in favor, I've forgotten how it is operationalized, but came out in favor of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So I think if there were more and more cities and states that, uh, that came out in favor of it, you know, uh, that the U.S. should be doing what's necessary to join that that treaty, be a good thing. So that's 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 a thing that's sort of on the table right now. It was very recently, I think, I forgot now if it was December or January. It was it was ratified. It's uh, enough people signed it, enough countries signed it that it is now uh, a treaty that's open for anybody to sign on to. My own my own worry about all of this is the verification procedures, and so I've, I've, some of my research is on. How do you verify that somebody really has got destroyed their nuclear weapons or you know, the thing they want to destroy is a nuclear weapon, that kind of thing. So that's, that's tricky. But being in favor of going that direction is absolutely a good thing, in my opinion. Great, thank you. Okay, well, maybe this is a good time to, uh, uh, yeah, to, uh, you know, shift into the uh, discussion session after the talk. 
Um, well, it looks like someone has a question there. Yeah, but maybe that, um, uh, is that myself? Or? What, should I ask a question now or should I just wait till the discussion? Why don't you wait for the discussion session? Sure, sure. Session, yes. Uh, yeah, so why don't 